Please take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn together to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. In many ways, uh, today's sermon's a little bit like what's been going on with the bridge. You know, it's kind of crazy, right? I mean, that, have you seen the pictures of the beam and the, the, the crack that's really a separation? It's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Uh, one of the things that's particularly remarkable, I think, though, and Ed Norton and I were talking about it before the services began, was the Daily Memphian reported that back in 2019, an Arkansas inspector had actually seen the rust in the beginning of a crack and actually warned if it wasn't fixed, if it wasn't dealt with, it could be serious. And of course, nothing happened, and here we are. Um, at one point, they were concerned that the crack might actually cause the whole DeSoto Bridge to fall down. In many ways, that's what we're doing this morning. Um, this is an opportunity for word and spirit together to, to work in your heart to see, is there any rust there? Are there any cracks showing? It's because God in his grace is coming asking you to investigate, to examine, and perhaps prevent a, a far more difficult exposure down the road. God in his grace is coming into this morning in his word. But in order to hear what God has for us this morning, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask him for it. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do bless you for your kindness. We bless you that you continue to declare your word to us by your spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and that you would open our eyes of faith, that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel. Lord, grant us your grace, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 42, uh, beginning in verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin Joseph's brother with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus, the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph was governor of the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where did you come from? He said, they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land you have come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you. Let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men... Let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you would not listen, so now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept, 
And he returned to them and spoke to them. He took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace, replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. Now go to verse 35. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they, when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you were to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I don't know if you pay attention to sports news at all, but if you have, you undoubtedly are aware that for the last several months, really since the end of the NFL season, Deshaun Watson has been in the news. First, uh, the former Clemson quarterback, the present quarterback of the Houston Texans was in the news because he wanted to force a trade from the Texans. But more recently, he's been in the news in that 22 different women have come out and accused him of uh, sexual harassment and other acts. These are all female massage therapists who are accusing him of these crimes. What, what makes it particularly painful, not only the, the awfulness of what is alleged to be happened, but when last fall, Deshaun Watson published a book with the Christian publisher Thomas Nelson in which he talks about how his faith commitments have propelled him to NFL stardom. And so publicly he was presenting one face, face and at least privately he was presenting another. Of course, it's not surprising, right? I mean, if you have wealth and fame and power in this world and you have skeletons in your closet, it's almost certain to come out, isn't it? We've seen it over and over again. It seems as though if you have some measure of notoriety, your sins will find you out. Of course, that's true not just for the rich and famous. That's true for all of us, isn't it? it it's true that, in fact, whatever skeletons we might have, whatever ways in which we might be trying to hide things, it seems like it's almost inevitable in the most inopportune times and the most inopportune ways that our skeletons seem to come out of the closet. Of course, that's right in the Bible. In Numbers chapter 32, um, the various tribes, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, had asked for permission to remain in the Transjordan region and not to cross over, to leave their families behind. But they promised Moses that they would go ahead and they would fight with their brothers to secure the promised land. And if, if Moses would simply allow them to keep the Transjordan region. And, and Moses agrees to the scheme. But then he says in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, but if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure your sin will find you out. And so it is, over and again. It seems as though the sins that we do in private, where, where no one can see and no one will know, those, those acts of violence, whether acts of violence in deed or acts of violence in thought or word, or, or whether it's the, the deep-seating failings that often recur, or whether it's the gossip and slander that we spread, whether by mouth or whether by email or whether by text message, it seems as though we, we do our best to keep all of it hidden. And we keep it all in the closet. And we trust that no one will ever know. We cover our, our steps to make sure that no one will discover what it is we're about. What we're really about. And yet inevitably, when we sin against the Lord, these things have a way of finding out. Of coming out. Of being known. But both in this text that we just read together, Genesis 42, as well as the, Deuteron as well as the Numbers text, it seems pretty clear, but, but it really raises a question, doesn't it? I mean, why? Why do our sins inevitably 
come out? Why, why are the, the skeletons that we keep in the closet that we think no one will ever know and no one will ever see, why is it that they come out? Why is it do we get exposed? Well, obviously, I mean, God does it, right? I mean, we've seen over and again that God is the one who governs all his creatures and all their actions. And as Moses had, had told the children of Israel, when you sin against the Lord, you may be sure your sin will find you out. But, but why does God do that? Why does God expose us? Why does God make sure that those things that we desperately want to keep hidden, why, why is it that they can't stay hidden? Why? 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 Is this simply some kind of bad karma where things just kind of boomerang around at us? Does God expose us because he hates us? Because he's really, he looks at us with some measure of disgust. Is, is that why these things get exposed? Is it because God has some kind of malevolent delight in seeing us suffer so that, so that we're forced to acknowledge that the, the imposter self that we put out there isn't the real self? No. He, he forces the, the imposter self and the real self to go. It, he does that because he hates us, right? No. No, it's the exact opposite. Friend, God loves you too much to leave you by yourself. His furious love for you is such that he, he wants the real you, not the imposter you. Not the false you you put out, this, this performance you that you, you want everybody else to think you've got it all together. You, you've checked all the boxes. You've gotten all the A's, right? The, the imposter you, no, that's not the real you. God knows the real you already, and he loves you too much to let you go on faking it. No, it's because of the furious love of God for you that he forces the fake you and the real you back together again. Because as we've already heard, God doesn't look at you according to your sins. He looks at you as his child, as one whom he desperately loves. And he loves you too much to leave you to yourself. That's what this chapter is teaching you. Not be sure that sin will find you out. But in fact, be sure that God's grace will find you out. God's grace. God's steadfast love and compassion. That's what actually causes our sins to find us out. I mean, that's what this passage is teaching us. In order to understand it, you have to understand some measure of the context of what's going on. We saw it at the end of the last chapter when Moses wrote, All the earth, chapter 20, uh, 41, verse 57, Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. And as part of all the earth is Palestine, is Canaan. Which means that ultimately Jacob's sons start to get hungry. The famine's reached there as well. And, and so finally Jacob tells them to go down. Just as Abraham in chapter 12 had, went, had gone down to Egypt in time of famine in order to survive. So Jacob is sending his sons down to Egypt to try to buy grain so that they might survive. And in the midst of this context that Moses sets, you have this really interesting little verse. It's verse 4. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. The other ten, they can go. But he refused to send Benjamin. Benjamin right about now is 20 years old. Certainly big enough, strong enough, able enough to defend himself. So, so why does Jacob not want Benjamin to go? Well, he feared for him. Why? He's with 10 other men. Big, burly, insensitive, like Judah kind of men. Was he fearful of, of the outsiders that might attack the brothers? Or was he actually fearful of his own sons? And what his own sons might do to Benjamin? You know, parents have a sixth sense about things. You know, we, we act kind of eh, ignorant and naive about what our kids are up to. But even when they're up to stuff, we kind of have this spidey sense, this tingling saying, eh, something doesn't, doesn't quite add up. Anyone here? I've had that. I'm sure you have as well. I think, I think Joseph, or excuse me, I think Jacob has his spidey sense going here. He knows something's not right about what happened to Joseph. He dare not send Benjamin 
with his brothers. And so, so he sends the other ten. And he refuses to send Benjamin. And, and almost immediately after they get there, the ten brothers, they meet Joseph. And this confrontation between their brother whom they thought was dead and the brothers takes place. Joseph, verse 6, tells you is the governor of all the land. He's the one who is selling all the grain. And, and there's several layers in verses 6 to 20 as they play out. But the two you need to know, and Natalie picked up on them as we read this passage together, is we're seeing everything from Joseph's perspective. That's the first thing. We know that how Joseph's story is played out. We're seeing it from his point of view. And so when he sees his brothers, he, 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 we see through his eyes how he's responding, what he's thinking, what he's trying to do. We're seeing everything from Joseph's point of view. And the other thing, though, that we know that Joseph's brothers don't is that Joseph has recognized his brothers twice. In fact, Moses tells you that. He sees them and recognizes them. And then when they speak, Moses tells you again that he's recognized them. And that, that recognition that Joseph knows his brothers, but his brothers don't know Joseph, it drives everything that happens in chapters 42, 43, and 44. As he responds to them, though, what does he do? He says to them, where do you come from? They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And in verse 8, and Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Verse 9, Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. Remember back in chapter 37, the ten, the ten sheaves of grain that were bowing to him. Now these ten brothers looking for grain, bowing to him. He remembered the dream. And then he says, you are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have not have come to buy food. We are sons of one man. We are honest men. That, that claim is going to be put to the test. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, no, it's the nakedness of the land you've come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the son of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. Joseph, again, will charge them with being spies at least two more times. He'll say it. And, and because of what's going on as he's engaged with them, he, he decides to throw them all in jail to buy some time. And then he comes up with this test. Leave one of you behind. Go back home. Get your brother. Bring him to me. And then I will believe you're honest men. Why does Joseph do this? Why does he propose this test? Is it simply revenge? Is he wanting his brothers to feel the, the awfulness, the shame of it all? Is, is he trying to work a revenge? No, I don't think so. I think this is actually a test. And it's a test that has two aspects. The, the first part of the test is by keeping Simeon and letting the others go, he's giving his brothers an opportunity to abandon Simeon, just like they had abandoned him. Remember, they, they put him in the pit while they were eating lunch. He's crying out. They don't heed his cry. They, they abandon him. When the Midianite traders come, they willingly sell him into slavery. And so by, by keeping Simeon in the pit, in the jail, he's giving these brothers an opportunity to either do what they did to him or to demonstrate their repentance by coming back for their brother. It's not clear why Simeon was chosen. Perhaps he was the least liked of the brothers. Perhaps the other brothers feared his anger, right? We've seen Simeon's anger in Genesis 34 and the genocide at Shechem. Maybe he's the least attractive. Maybe he was the most obvious person who could be abandoned by the brothers. Joseph's pretty savvy about all of this. But regardless, he chooses Simeon. That's the first part of the test. But the second part of the test was by requiring the brothers to bring Benjamin he would have an opportunity, Joseph would, to discover if they hated him, Benjamin, like they hated Joseph, or whether there was a change, whether in fact there was repentance. Again, this makes sense, right? There was this interfamily rivalry between the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Leah, the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah. They, they sympathized with the Leah part of the family. So it was 10 against two. Now, 10 against 1, since Joseph was not there. And so if the brothers hated Benjamin because of this rivalry, Joseph would know. There was only one way to find out. 
He needed to lay his eyes on him. That was the test. It's, it's shrewd, isn't it? It's a shrewd way to bring about a confrontation in order to see whether the brothers have in fact really changed. But don't miss why he's doing this. This isn't about revenge. This is about charting whether the brothers have experienced repentance or, or even contrition. I mean, it's clear from what we've read, there is some measure of at least guilt. There's some measure of shame. You hear it in verse 21, they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And then Reuben pipes up, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen, so now there comes a reckoning for his blood. I told you so, Reuben says. But you hear these notes of contrition. They clearly acknowledge their culpability. They acknowledge their, their blood guilt. And, and they thought they had it all in the closet, right? This happened 13, 15, maybe even 20 years before. I wonder how often they reflected back to that day. Each time something bad happened, something to one of their kids or as their father's health declined, did they go back to that day? Did they replay that moment? Did they say what they said in Joseph's presence? It's clear that they believe that, that, that this is a punishment from God. What's going on here now? Simeon in jail. They're having to go back. They're having to try to get Benjamin. They clearly see this as a punishment. You see that in verse 28. Their hearts sank when they discover the money in one of their bags. And they say, what is this that God has done to us? Even the, the grace of Joseph returning a, some of the money, they don't realize he's returned all of their money. They're convinced that God's actually punishing them. They're certain that God's against them. The words that Jacob say could have been said by any of them. In verse 36, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon's no more. Now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. They could all say that, couldn't they? My sins have found me out. And even the grace and mercy that's meant to expose them is seen as a, a judgment, as a punishment. But here's the thing. God was actually exposing their sin in order to bring them to contrition, in order to bring them to repentance, in order to bring them to restoration. My friends, this is not a harsh punishment. This is actually a grace. This is a sign of God's steadfast love, his furious, reckless love for his people, his intense love for his own. And that's the case not just for these 10 men, it's the case for you. So many things that come into our lives and we are sure that there's some kind of karma working. Some kind of boomerang action of something that we did way back there that we thought we had covered up. And suddenly this is happening and we think, oh, if I hadn't done this, that wouldn't have happened. Well, really what the issue is, is that thing that's back there you've never dealt with. You've put it in the closet. You've hidden it away. You think nobody knows. You've covered up your steps. And suddenly, God is at work to expose it because he does not want you to remain an imposter. Acting as though you have it all together, when in fact you really don't. None of us do. None of us have it all together. The root confession of every single one of us is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God doesn't call the righteous ones. He calls sinners. Each one of us, we qualify. The real question is whether we're going to be honest about it or not. Some of us have been holding on to deep anger and rage, and we think nobody knows. Or it's maybe some know because we've been telling others about it, but we've not actually dealt with it. And it's sitting there undealt with, and thing after thing is happening, and God is pursuing you. He's pursuing you right now. As you listen to what I'm saying to you, he's pursuing you right now in his grace, trying to warn you that just like the bridge two years ago, there's rust there. The cracks are beginning to show. Will you listen to the voice of God now? The grace of God pursuing you now? Or will you have something that might cause everything to crumble down? 
because you haven't dealt with that thing, whatever it might be. You see, when God comes in his grace to us, in order to draw us to contrition and repentance and ultimately to draw us to himself, to his own love for us, his abiding compassion for us, there's a conflict that ensues. We begin to wrestle with the grace of God, don't we? Well, these brothers are wrestling. Just as surely as Jacob wrestled with the angel, so these brothers are wrestling with God as well. As they relate to what their father, what, what had happened to them, uh, it's notable what they leave out. There's, there's no mention of jail time, the three days they spend in jail. There's no direct mention of Simeon being left in jail. Their father has to count noses. Hey, somebody's missing. Wait, Simeon, where is he? Right? No mention of Simeon. No mention, ultimately, of the threat of execution that hangs over Simeon as a spy. In place of all this, they relate a few of the details, but, but ultimately they, they try to put a good face on it. If we just bring Benjamin back, then everything will be well with us. But above all, what do they not mention to their dad? Hey, Dad, remember 20 years ago when we told you that Joseph had been killed by a wild beast? Yeah, that was a lie. They didn't tell him that, did they? And yet it was the perfect opportunity to do so. The perfect opportunity. As God's grace was pursuing them right there, they had the opportunity to finally own what they had done. And, and Jacob himself, whether he knew it or not, had shot an arrow at their heart when he said, you have bereaved me of my children. That is absolutely true. Those ten men, they had bereaved Jacob of his son, Joseph. And they had every opportunity at that point to say, you know what, Dad, you're right. More than you know, you're right. But they didn't, did they? There's still this conflict. This conflict as they're wrestling with the grace of God in their lives. You have this crazy offer from Reuben promising to kill his two children, his two boys, if, if, if Benjamin is harmed. And, of course, Jacob doesn't receive that at all. It's clear he doesn't trust his sons. Verse 38, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he's the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you were to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. It's the same language as verse 4. This, this chapter is bookended with that. My son shall not go down if harm should happen to him. What harm? Well, from Jacob's perspective... What happened to Joseph, who was with him, was brothers. What happened to Simeon, who was with him, his brothers. Why should I trust Benjamin to his brothers when I'm already bereaved now of two sons? In other words, the distrust that is that's percolating in this situation, in this family, is all because of this unconfessed, un, un, unowned sin. The skeletons in the closet. And the, and the open question at the end of this chapter is simply this. What's going to happen? Will these brothers respond to the grace of God that's pursuing them? Will the grace of God finally overwhelm them so that they embrace the opportunity to, to own their, their mess, their stuff here in this? Will they give up being imposters, acting to, to their father like their dutiful sons, when in fact they have blood on their hands? But the question really isn't so much for these characters from thousands of years ago. The open question this morning is for you. Will you allow grace to find you out? Will you allow the steadfast love of God, who even now is in those dark places in your heart, he's showing you these patterns of sin, whatever they may be, that you think nobody else can see, nobody else knows, you think you've got your tracks covered up? Will you allow God's grace to actually enter into those places and put you back together again? Because your God wants the real you. He knows you. He doesn't deal with you according to your false self. He deals with you according to his steadfast love for you. That's why he's pursuing you. Will you stop wrestling with grace this morning? Will you leave this place saying, thank God 
that his grace has found me out. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, it is with glowing heart that we would praise you because your grace, it meets us in these dark and guilty places, not just sexually, but in all kinds of ways, and all the lies that we've told, in all the ways we've dishonored others, and all the gossip we have spread, the slander, the lies, in all these ways, these patterns, Lord, these dark and guilty places we think nobody else knows about. You do. And in your mercy and grace, you don't leave us to ourselves, which is to say to leave us to judgment. No, in your steadfast love, you continue to pursue us. Thank you, Lord. And so we would praise you. We would rejoice in you. We would say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Lord, send us away, not fearful, not angry, but rejoicing in the grace of God shown to us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.